Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be part of a growing uh, uh, community. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Motorescu, and I'm uh, an anthropologist at the Central European University, uh, as well as the holder of the uh, RASHOSS uh, IMERA chair. And uh, I will present uh, today, uh, very briefly, the three projects uh, I've been working on, um, uh, both in my capacity as, uh, as an urban anthropologist, uh, uh, my uh, also uh, uh, a project in uh, religious studies, the, the Jewish revival movements in Europe, and finally the specific project I'm, uh, I'm trying to accomplish at uh, IMERA on, um, on food and uh, borders. So this is kind of an intellectual or, or research trajectory. Uh, I was uh, uh, born in, uh, in Jaffa, Israel, went to a French uh, Catholic school. Uh, if you know a bit Israel, you, you can understand how weird uh, uh, this is, where I was often the only Jew in class uh, with a majority of uh, Arab Palestinians and some uh, French uh, diplomats and mainly African uh, African uh, f families, so both diplomats and uh, and uh, labor migrants. Um, <clears throat> so I was kind of forced into anthropology, as it were, uh, and, and I made it into, uh, uh, into my profession. So let's start uh, briefly with my urban project. My urban project is an attempt uh, uh, to understand very uh, specific discourses that uh, link between the urban and, and the national. So for example, this statement, which I find beautiful, the right of return uh, to all Jaffa, which was a major slogan during the 2011 events uh, uh, in uh, in Israel and Palestine, kind of a reaction to the uh, to the Arab Spring event, but they were recalibrated to fit the the local local grievances, right? And what is beautiful about these uh, slogans is that they combine the national or nationalist uh, right of return discourse and the local urban discourse of the old city being gentrified. And, and colonized, right? I'm particularly interested in uh, binational, what I call binational urbanism, that is in sites that are actually cohabitated, shared uh, by Palestinians and, uh, uh, and Jewish uh, Israeli activists or residents. And in many ways, I'm trying to uh, bring some uh, uh, sociological evidence to, to poetic, uh, uh, to what we can call the poetics of space. For example, this a beautiful poem by Mahmoud Darwish who talks about the dialectic or the, the paradox of war, right? And this is specifically to Mahmoud Darwish's uh, experience. But the fact that war, as is the case in the ethnically mixed towns I'm interested in, actually bring people uh, uh, together, people that otherwise would not be forced to, uh, to cohabitate. And I develop in my work this notion of contrived coexistence, right? that coexistence that is not necessarily a form of choice, but a fait accompli, or actually almost a fact that you have to you have to reckon with. I wrote two books on on the special one book on the special history of Jaffa, and another on life stories of elderly people who actually live Palestinians and Jews who live in the same city and try to. Uh, uh, to look back at their uh, shared experience, so I'm trying to juxtapose the identity politics uh, against what I call the politics uh, of existence. So these are the some scenes from the from the streets of cities like Jaffa, Haifa, Ramle, Lid, and other cities where you have at least a significant minority of Palestinians of about 20 to 30 percent. So this is an example of activists calling for housing rights, both in Arabic and in Hebrew. Uh, another attempt of mobilizing. Uh, binational urban, uh, urbanisms uh, against the realities of gentrification. Uh, and finally, uh, larger uh, uh, demonstrations by Palestinians and Israelis uh, talking about uh, corruption, talking about public housing, talking about uh, gentrification. You can see no to gentrification. So there's something really um, interesting about the links between these cities, especially Jaffa and Haifa and, and Marseille. And part of my work here is also trying to look at the larger framework of, of Mediterranean cities and what kind of claims 
they, uh, they produce. So here you see Palestinian and Jewish uh, activists working together, uh, sometimes in very extreme conditions, like, uh, uh, like a, a very traditional a Mizrahi neighborhood in South Tel Aviv called Hatikva, talking about a revolution, a Palestinian Mizrahi uh, revolution, and of course the notions of, of uh, center and periphery that were central in the last, uh, uh, in the last decade, right? To the extent of uh, really radical discourses that what, are what I call momentary radicalization or situational radicalization. Uh, so this is my urban project, again, an attempt to link together different moments of Mediterranean urbanism. The second uh, project uh, that I'm now completing a book on, I got an advanced contract, which is something a bit uh, frustrating, because you never know if it's, uh, it will be published, but probably it will be published. It's an edited volume on the different facets of Jewish revival in uh, what is often called the, the three pillars of, of uh, world Judaism, Israel, Europe, and the US, but also in China. So you have Chabad, uh, Chabad Lubavitch uh, uh, branches uh, also appearing in places uh, like China. And the general attempt is try to, uh, to put it uh, simply and simplistically to how do social movements rebrand God? And it's not my concept, it's actually uh, a concept by an interesting actor in New York, an African-American who uh, is active in the Jewish revival movements, and he's talking about uh, rebranding God in a very interesting way. He says, if we are part of a movement, then this movement has a lot of power right now. This movement has a huge task in front of her to rebrand God. So this is kind of a, uh, he's part of a uh, punk Jews uh, movement, but there are also very institutionalized global outreach movements like the Chabad, who are trying, as you see here, to reconfigure the relevance of Jewish identity in, uh, uh, in, in our uh, post-secular or transnational or global uh, era, right? And Chabad is extremely strong. It's extremely strong also in, in Marseille. If you haven't known, uh, uh, it works in a very specific, uh, a very specific model of what they call uh, uh, kind of form of missionary Judaism, but what are also what are called uh, shlichim or em uh, emissaries, where people are assigned to live in a place for the rest of their lives with their family, and after a few years of aid, they are supposed to be completely financially financially independent and create a community. And this is what is happening in most cities in Europe and the world today, where this movement is growing exponentially and killing also local, uh, uh, local trajectories of, of Jewish life. So what we are trying to do is to map these movements uh, on a kind of... Uh, simple uh, uh, two-dimensional uh, uh, table where we're talking about the, 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 the orientation, the temporal orientation, or the audience, whether we're talking about individual uh, uh, transformation project or about collective transformation projects. Uh, and basically, we're trying to understand sometimes uh, funny scenes like this uh, 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 poster in Budapest uh, as part of a, of a Jewish festival every year of uh, how Jewishness is becoming sexy, right? Or how Jewishness is becoming uh, relevant. And this is, especially in the post-socialist context, this is extremely, extremely important because uh, Jewishness has been stigmatized for many years. And now there is the new generation trying to come back and try to brand it and make, to make it relevant again. Uh, conceptually speaking, we're dealing with different forms of temporalities the three temporalities we call survival, revival, and renewal, each trying to position uh, in the specific projects in time uh, and space. So one is, is, a, is a project of survival, right, constantly dealing with the specters of the Holocaust. Another is a project of revival, trying, like Chabad, trying to link it to an orthodox uh, 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 history or tradition. And the third is what we can call renewal, which is almost creating something uh, anew. Okay? Oh. So um, <laughs> the golden part is cut and paste from a... Um, uh, and then we can talk about more broadly about different modalities, right? So the temporal, temporality, subjectivity, institutionalization, and spatiality, we won't get into uh, the details. Hopefully we'll have time to talk about it more. Uh, so let me just give you a, a, a funny 
but interesting and important example, the combination of New Age, shamanism, feminism, and Jewish uh, renewal. And this is a movement called Kohanot. You know, you know the concept from North Africa also, but the idea of the Kohen, right, the priest, uh, who is now becoming uh, uh, also feminized and also linked with a very specific notion of the Shekhinah. And the Shekhinah, like the Sakina, it's an Islamic, Semitic, or whatever, it's a, it's a monotheistic concept where uh, here the divine spirit is, uh, uh, is transforming into a very specific relation between women, uh, 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 between the feminine body and, uh, and the nature, right? So you can see here the figure of a female rabbi with the kippah uh, reinventing a form of engagement with the divine and with nature, including some very... Um, uh, uh, provocative uh, images in one of the one of one photographer a, a, about precisely the, the, the subjectivity or the centrality of femininity in uh, uh, Jewish faith. So this is my second project. Uh, the third project, which I'm mainly focusing on this year, is uh, uh, the, uh, the the the. He, historical and political aspects of, of wine. And I'm doing it through the, uh, the tension of the dialectic between terroir as a quality space and territoire or territory as a, a political space. Okay? Uh, I'm also trained as a, as a sommelier, both in Italy and, and in Austria, and this is helping me to try to understand the technicalities of uh, uh, this world. So uh, just to give you an example of how wine can become a political actor, uh, last year, uh, one of the settler wineries, one of the wineries in the West Bank uh, owned by, uh, by a settler, by a Jewish settler, uh, uh, produced uh, a, a special series called Pompeo wine. And do you know who's Pompeo? Mike. Mike Pompeo. So Mike Pompeo, the American Secretary of State, Trump's American Secretary of State, was an important actor because a few months ago, he, for the first time, he physically uh, came to the West Bank and, and recognized, acknowledged the legality of, uh, of, of settlements, right? This hasn't been done before by a major American uh, uh, politician. And the reason that Psagot Winery, this winery dedicated the whole series of wine to Pompeo is that he basically went against uh, the European Court of Justice ruling and the Canadian Federal Court ruling regarding food mislabeling, right? And this is a story that is uh, also known in France, uh, the, the question of provenance, right? The, the most important question in the terroir uh, uh, discourse. So in France, uh, when wine comes from, the, um, uh, from, a West, from a settlement, it has to be uh, uh, labeled as colonie israelienne. <clears throat> it cannot be used as made in Israel in uh, in Europe. And what this uh, winery is trying to do under the hashtag made in legality, uh, which is a very smart hashtag, is to try to normalize basically the production of food <coughs> in, uh, uh, um, in settlements. Uh, in my work I'm trying to look at many different cases and, and see the, 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 this dialectic between terroir and territory to point that basically uh, terroir can be territorialized made into a, a political project, like in the case of Tokai, between Hungary and uh, Slovakia and other border regions, or vice versa, that territory can be ter terrorized, right? That territory can be made into a quality space uh, and, and depoliticized, as it were. And I'll show you a few, uh, a few examples. <clears throat> Basically, we are now living in, a, in an era where terroir is part of a global discourse. It's not, it's, not anymore a local French uh, framework. It's not even a European framework. People in Japan, the, you know, Koji and, and uh, part of the fermentation culture in Japan are talking about terroir. Durian uh, producers in uh, Malaysia are, are talking about terroir. Fishermen in uh, Senegal are talking about meroir, which is a form of... Uh, of uh, seaside uh, terroir, etc., etc., in the U.S., even Native Americans in Canada are talking about Native American terroir. Uh, pardon? It's a, global it's a global narrative, right? And the question: This is what Master of Wine Deborah Maibro called beautifully terroir fervor. So we have really a fascination, both in the old world and the new world, uh, 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 a fascination with the language of terroir, with a specific connection with uh, uh, with land. 
And what I'm trying to do in this book project is to frame it <coughs> as part of a border phenomenon, right? To talk about uh, uh, specific forms of terroir in terms of contraction or expansion. Contraction is what happens when uh, empires like the Austro-Hungarian empires, and we are both from Central European University, obsessed perhaps with the, with the Austro-Hungarian empire, when they collapse. Right? When they collapse, they produce countries like Austria, uh, uh, Slovenia, uh, che Czechoslovakia, which then turned into uh, uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic, and Hungary. And some of these terroir, like the famous Tokai, uh, 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 wine terroir, which uh, Louis XIV called the wine of king and the king of wines, the first uh, botrytized wine, uh, um, um, uh, basically became a border problem, right? And when it becomes a border problem, politics and territorial politics comes in. And I'm trying to analyze how uh, terroir contraction of different empires, the British Empire, the French Empire, and the, uh, 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 the Austro-Hungarian Empire are producing specific relations uh, uh, which I call border wines, right? So this is true in Steiermark, uh, in Slovenia, it's true in Burgenland, in Austria, and uh, it's also true in many ways in uh, the relations between Algeria and France, and I'll get to that in a second. The second modality is that of terroir expansion. So what happens in places like Australia or the US or Israel and Palestine, where terroir becomes kind of a production, a project, a political project of expansion. Uh, then borders transform into what we call frontiers, right? And, and then uh, it's not necessarily about lines, delimiting political units, but about wilderness, right? About nature uh, uh, and about indigenous uh, populations. The third configuration, which I'm still trying to think about now, uh, is what I call geological nationalism, or the new frontiers of wine. We see that with the uh, UK, uh, uh, Kent trying, uh, producing champagne wine and winning competitions against champagne, but also producing a discourse of connectivity, right? Arguing that basically uh, 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 the terroir of uh, South, uh, uh, South, South England is actually the same as the terroir of champagne, right? And there are geological evidence to that. Uh, and against Brexit and, and climate change, this, is, this makes it for a very interesting argument. So th this book project is really about the global mobility and adaptability of food and wine concepts to take terroir as a root metaphor uh, for globalization and uh, migration, uh, uh, etc. Uh, some examples are not from wine. Uh, for example, one uh, case I'm working on is the migration of this mango-based sauce, a form of chutney, which originated in India but then through in the 19th century arrived to Iraq uh, and then in the 1950s, when the Jews of Iraq came to Israel and Palestine and to London, it kind of traveled. And nowadays, you can find Amba. Uh, Amba is uh, 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 an Indian uh, Amharati word for uh, uh, mango. Uh, you can find it on Traders Joe, so it's basically becoming a global. In Israel and in Palestine, in some places, it's... Uh, uh, kind of a staple uh, street food. And my question, the question I'm trying to ask is, under which conditions do, uh, uh, does food become uh, an icon of national, national identity, right? Like falafel and hummus, that are national of, uh, an icon of national identity in Israel and Palestine, but also in Lebanon in many ways. Uh, some cases are not, like Amba. So why not, how come it can be appropriated but not politicized? Uh, another example is the kushari that also originated in the Indian uh, diaspora, uh, uh, not in the Indian diaspora, but in, in the British Empire, and arrived in, uh, in Egypt, probably through the, uh, through the Indian and Pakistani soldiers, and became kind of a national dish, as it were. All right? So is it reducible to mjaddara, as one uh, Claudio Ridan, for example, told me, the famous food historian, or is it something that, that replays these uh, relations between empire and, and nation states? Uh, so for terroir contraction, this is the, 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 the story of a French, for example, this is Samuel Tino, he's a French producer who lives now in, in Tokai and produces uh, uh, the famous Asu uh, botrytized uh, uh, wine. It's a story of, it's a kind of a trauma, it's a story of a trauma, right? A story of the Kingdom of Hungary that lost two-thirds of its territory after the Versailles 
or the Tiananmen uh, agreements in 1920 and are basically lamenting their, uh, their loss since then. So this is the village that, uh, where Tokai is cut in between uh, uh, Slovakia and, uh, and, and, and Hungary, right? So to talk about wine in, in Hungary is, uh, to talk about Tokai wine in Hungary is, is, is always extremely contentious, right? Because it represents the empire, the, you know, the whole that the nation used to be. Uh, this is another example between Italy, uh, Croatia, and Slovenia. There's a beautiful book recently uh, published by a wine writer about one terroir, three uh, countries. The second example uh, is uh, the example of terroir expansion. And, and uh, for me, one of the great things, uh, I feel privileged being here because I discovered the story of, of France and, and Algiers, the notion of Algerian wine. And this is the first uh, kind of aha moment I had when I discovered this poster. And, and I find it fascinating. I, I found it on the web, right? And now I'm, I'm, I'm in touch with Musem because I did some, a project for, for the Musem uh, folklore uh, uh, exhibition on terroir. They called it terroirism. And uh, uh, I'm trying to look in archives for this, this kind of... of uh, so what, what strikes you about this poster? Let me just ask you, when do you think, how would you date it? Yeah. So this is 1933, but when, how, what's, what's striking about this poster? I mean, for me, there is a textual aspect and a visual aspect. Let's start with the visual. What, what, what is the visuality of it? Yes. So this is kind of Sovietic, uh, almost Sovietic or you know, totalitarian, very modernistic aesthetics, right? So one graphic designer uh, asked about, told me that you know, there's almost a, uh, you know, a fascistic element to it, right? So the, the sun is rising, the very gendered position of the man holding the grapes, the, the flag, uh, uh, very powerful. At the same time, we have, what else do you notice about the text? There's something excessive about it, right? Look how many times France is... is right, so there's la Gérie Française, la France Algérienne, which is not evident, of course, because in, in most discourses people talk about Algérie Française, but not about France Algérienne. And then again, cons uh, French consumer drink this French wine. So there's kind of a repetition, perhaps almost a, an over-repetition, over-representation of the notion of Frenchness, which seems to be... needs to be defended, right? Uh, and uh, this is a, a framework of what I'm trying to do. The history is famous. Uh, Thomas Partner is a specialist on, on, on this history. Uh, I don't claim to be because for me this is just, just a case study within the larger project of uh, terroir contraction and extraction. But what happened in Algeria is that Algeria basically saved with the hit of phylloxera, uh, uh, with this disease that killed almost all of the vineyards in the continent and in France specifically, Algeria uh, rose and almost saved the day uh, uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, and basically allowed France to keep production, uh, uh, production high. The, 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 the story is a discourse of fraud, uh, uh, of overproduction, but also the, the very constru construction of the Appellation d'Origine Contrôlée in the 1930s, in 1935, is part of the story, right? So I'm trying to, to uh, and of course, in, after decolonization, the retreat of France. So the question of whether Algiers was uh, part of the French terroir or not, uh, Dion, Roger Dion, there's a famous authority in the wine history. He did not, in, in his famous book, published 1959, uh, he did not include Algeria as part of the French terroir, right? But it was still considered to be part, kind of an extension, right, of, of, of France. So here you see the, the production uh, of Algerian wine. So Algeria basically was the world's, from the 30s to the 60s, uh, the time of the constitution of the Appellation Contrôlée uh, legislation was the world's largest wine exporter and the fourth largest uh, wine producer. This is huge, right? And, and you can see that there is an interesting uh, correspondence between uh, 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 the, the growth of Algerian wine and some political, uh, some political events and, and local events. 
Another interesting thing is that you notice that if the canonization was here, so wine did not follow wine, wine production in, 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 in Algeria. This is something that took a decade, probably until the nationalization of wine in Algeria. And the whole relationship between Algeria and France for me is an interesting example of both terroir expansion and terroir uh, uh, contraction. Uh, finally, Israel, uh, which is where I did a lot of uh, field work, is interesting in this respect. Uh, you can imagine why. So this is a, a few months ago, an Israeli professional wine organization published for the first time the terroir map of Israel. And what do you notice here? Yeah, Palestine is kind of nowhere to be seen, right? So this is, here is a, a small place called Gaza, which is not part, perhaps doesn't have terroir or it's not relevant. And here is the West Bank. Uh, uh, so basically this is a form of an expansion or a form of, of an annexation even. And when I talked to people from this organization, they told me that, you know, it's a terroir map, so we don't think about borders. But we do know borders because we have the Egyptian border, the Jordanian border, the Lebanese border, and the Syrian border. So uh, uh, border is definitely a Pandora box when you start to think about uh, uh, terroir politically. Uh, this is a, uh, an award-winning winery. I did ethnographic field work there. I, I was working in harvest, etc. And what they are trying to do is sell the wine as temple wine. So basically to draw on the long durée of uh, wine production in, 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 uh, in ancient times in, in the, the land of Israel or Palestine and to, to market it as a, 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 current, uh, a current beverage of luxury. What uh, uh, Lucien Carpique, the, the French sociologist, called the singularity. Okay? Palestinians, of course, are, are resisting. We see that the language of uh, Sumud or the language of steadfastness, we live and exist here, are, uh, is important. You see the segregation uh, uh, line uh, cutting through. This is Kemizan, which is a, a, a monastery next to uh, Jerusalem. Part of the story is also the story of indigenous grapes, right? which is extremely important in France, extremely important in Italy, extremely important in Greece in all the uh, uh, important uh, pr uh, wine producing countries. And here there is a combination of genetic reverse engineering of, of terroir and an attempt to reinvent, as it were, or rediscover the ancient, uh, the ancient. So this is New York Times, Israel aims to recreate wine that Jesus and Keith David drank. Uh, the language of indigenousness is working also in Canada. Uh, this is a wine recalled indigenous world where they are trying to uh, mobilized uh, wine, terroir, as part of a discourse of indigeneity. And finally, my example is, uh, my, my work also tries to see how expansion works by, by commodifying uh, uh, wine stories. And this is uh, 19 Crimes, an Australian company trying to sell wine, trying to sell colonialism as heritage, okay? Because there is no strong discourse of terroir, but there is a very strong discourse of pioneers. And they write, this is the back label, uh, 19 crimes turned criminals into colonialists. Upon conviction, these men, guilty of at least one of the 19 crimes, are sentenced to, li to, to live in Australia rather than death. The punishment by transportation began in 1786. And many of the lawless died at sea for the uh, uh, rough-hewn man who made it to shore. A, world, a new world awaited as pioneers in a frontier colony. They forged a new country and new lives brick by brick. This wine honors the history they wrote and the culture they built. Okay, so this is a very interesting way of how patrimony or how heritage is, uh, is produced in the new world. And the last addition to the story is that Snoop Dogg, the, the famous <laughs> rapper, is now, now owns a label in 19 Crimes, which is called the Cabbie Red. And they justify it by saying that Snoop Dogg embodies the values of 19 Crimes, rule breaking, creating, and overcoming Everybody. adversity through hard work and perseverance, right? So it's, it, you see how uh, terroir or wine can start with a very strong discourse, uh, sometimes nationalist, uh, um, uh, of, of location, uh, 
uh, of provenance and can go you know, very far. And finally, this is a story of uh, Champagne in England. You see Tétanger with the English flag and Master of Wine, McGrath, with the French strike, uh, trying to produce a new, basically the future of, perhaps the future of French wine. Because of climate change, uh, uh, wineries throughout France, throughout the continent, are try I ha have to deal with, with, the, with the different, uh, with the changing uh, uh, conditions. For Tétanger, it's an investment in the future, right? All this trying to talk, they talk like when you see how they talk, amongst themselves that talks about William the Conqueror. So who is William the Conqueror? Is Tétanger William the Conqueror conquering UK? Or is the English wine William the Conqueror conquering France again, right? So again, the, uh, my attempt is to use wine as uh, kind of the back door into some very big questions that otherwise I would feel incompetent to do. Thank you.